everyone, in this lecture we're going to talk about skeletal muscle uh, structure and function. And so um, we'll go through some of it pretty quick and some of it a little bit slower, uh, but you should use this uh, in context with your textbook and even anatomy and physiology textbook uh, to sometimes uh, get a little bit more on this if this video uh, leaves you with some questions. Um, so when we talk about skeletal muscle, it is important to realize that the human body does contain over 600 skeletal muscles. Uh, a lot of them... Uh, you know, are smaller. They're not necessarily the big ones we think about, but you do have over 600 doing uh, various uh, fine to large motor skills across the board. Uh, and they do make up to about 40 to 50 percent of your total body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, uh, about uh, 80 to 100 pounds of your total body weight is muscle. So it's it's a whole lot um, of our mass is, is these skeletal muscles. And so they're really important. And so remember, every component of the body, every piece of the body uh, has a specific task that's assigned to it, uh, assigned to it, or that, uh, a very specific job that it at least does. Uh, and so for skeletal muscles, that's force production and um, really force production. But what that does is that leads to our movement or locomotion, uh, things like breathing, uh, postural support, so how we kind of hold ourselves upright. Um, and heat production even. So that force production uh, uses a lot of that ATP we talked about, and we lose a lot of that potential energy when we use ATP through heat. And so because our skeletal muscles are a large percentage of our body, we can generate heat through that, especially if we're really cold. Shivering is an example of that, uh, where your body gets too cold and we shiver, and it's the best way to actually warm ourselves up when we are too cold. Um, and so when it comes to our skeletal muscles, um, Typically, we can group uh, our, our skeletal muscles uh, into their actions, which are tip typically either flexors or extensors. And so if you think about your arm uh, and your elbow, so think about your elbow, how that moves kind of like a hinge on a door. Um, you have muscles that work as both flexors and you have muscles that work as extensors uh, when it comes to your arm. So if you hold your arm out straight and you fold it up kind of like you're reaching up to scratch your face or bring food to your mouth, um, what's happening there is your uh, flexor muscles, your biceps, are decreasing that joint ankle angle. They're making it smaller. Um, but then when you go to extend your arm to reach out for something, uh, what's going to happen is your triceps on the back side of your arm are going to be your extensors where they're increasing that joint angle uh, and extending that arm. And so every kind of joint has muscles that are flexors and extensors. Um, and so where that leads us to is that's some basics about muscles. We want to start talking about their, their structure. And so when we talk about a single muscle, so again, we'll use the bicep muscle because you can see that top in front of your arm right there. Uh, you can easily view that. Um, your muscles are, uh, they have these different kind of uh, layers to them. And so what you have is the outer layer is called the, the, epim the epimysum, uh, which surrounds the entire muscle. It's like this connective tissue that surrounds the entire muscle, keeps it all packaged together. Uh, but in there you have this uh, paramecium, and so this surrounds bundles of muscle fibers. So if you've ever taken like a rope uh, that has multiple strands in it, you can see that uh, there's one big rope, which would be kind of like the epimycin, and then the paramycin is those bigger bundles of rope that are together. So uh, if you think about like an old style shipping rope, uh, there's a giant rope, and then inside of that there are the, like these smaller sections of rope, three or four of them that are twisted together to make the big rope. Uh, and so in the muscle, these are called fascicles. And then in each of these fascicles, um, you have um, you have individual muscle fibers. So those would be the individual strands that kind of fray over time in that rope. Uh, and these are surrounded by a layer of endomycin, uh, kind of a protective layer around each muscle fiber. Um, and so when you once you continue to kind of go a little bit further, um, you eventually have some uh, some basement membrane just below that, and then eventually you get to the outer cell layer of a muscle fiber called the sarcolemma. So there's a lot of connective tissues that kind of keep our muscles bunched up together, keep them um, protected, provide nutrients to some extent, uh, but are really there to keep them in the proper alignment and shape that they need to be in to cause that movement to occur. And so that can kind of be seen here on this uh, particular example. And again, 
This is the whole muscle right here. Uh, and then you have these fascicles. Uh, again, you can see those here. You have multiple of them. And if you pull that out, that would be a fascicle uh, with that par paramyceum. Uh, and then if you look in there, you see that you have individual muscle fibers. And you can pull that out and you get your sarcolemma. And then inside of this, we'll talk a little bit further about what's called a myofibril. Um, and how that structure is really just the same. It's taking this uh, structure that's really simple on the inside and it continues just to pack more and more of these into a single thing. And so that's the layout of our muscle. So our muscle cells are unique in several roles. Um, and so this is a really good thing. And so what we have is we have things called satellite cells throughout a muscle fiber. A muscle fiber is really one of the largest um, individual cells in the body. So you can actually see a muscle fiber uh, without a microscope. So if I was to remove one muscle fiber from your arm and hold it up, um, it's actually about the size of a human hair. So if you pulled out one of your hairs and you could see it, well, that's about how a muscle fiber would look. Um, and so they're really large cells and that makes them different because uh, remember repair, regrowth, getting nutrients all happens through diffusion and is a really important factor when it comes to this. And so with the fusion taking place in such a large fiber, sometimes we have to have multiple things uh, that occur. And so in our muscles, we have things called satellite cells, which are responsible for uh, muscle growth, but also repair if they get damaged. Um, and the way they do this is they have multiple um, nucleuses throughout uh, a single muscle fiber. So most of our cells in our body have one nucleus, Muscle fibers actually have multiple nuclei throughout the entire cell so that they can be exactly where they need to be um, and work quickly to repair or grow muscles because uh, we work out and those muscles get damaged and they need to be repaired uh, fairly quickly. Uh, usually within about 48 hours they are, are being repaired um, and we don't need that to take longer. Could you imagine if we didn't have multiple nucleus in a cell and it took us a week or two to repair our muscles if they got injured well that means you can only work out heavily once or twice you know uh, once a week or once every other week and that would be very detrimental we couldn't grow muscle uh, if that was the case um, and so each of these nuclei in a muscle has what's called a myonuclear domain so they have like an area that they call theirs and they take care of kind of like thinking a subdivision uh, each family lives in a house and they're responsible for the yard uh, and the maintenance of that house. Well, these nucleus kind of have their own area that they are responsible for. And so with training, what, what you'll see is you'll get more nuclei that occur uh, so that they can, uh, basically each nucleus is responsible for a smaller area of the muscle, meaning that they can uh, help repair it and grow quicker, which means we can train more and see greater strength changes over time. Um, and so... What happens now is, um, now that you kind of have that understanding, we do want to talk about these kind of microscopic structures with the muscle. So all the things that we're seeing here, we've talked about so far, are kind of like more ma macroscopic things, uh, big picture ideas, but we need to start getting into that micro microscopic structure. Uh, and so these are called those myofibrils, which you can go back, pause the video, or rewind it and look at that picture, pull this up and kind of look at it. So those myofibrils inside of each muscle fiber are where we actually generate force. It's the muscle generating force component, sorry, muscle generate, the, the force generating component of a muscle. Um, and inside those myofibrils, there's the structure of what we call actin and myosin. Uh, these are the things that actually help our muscles to move and generate force, and they are the things that get shorter to cause that movement. And so actin is considered the thin filament, and myosin is considered what we call thick filament. Um, and so inside these myofibrils, they can actually be visually seen under a microscope, um, but they're broken up into these kind of like pieces where you can actually see this color differential of like these sections of the myofibril that's repeated over and over again. And this is called a sarcomere. Uh, this is a little section you could cut out and there's a structure to it that allows for this force to be generated and movement to occur. Uh, and this includes uh, different sections of this called the M line, the Z line, A zone, A band, and I band. And I think there's a picture here coming up. So we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, so we'll look a little bit more at these in a second. But just realize these this is what's actually generating that force. But there are supporting structures that help with that. 
And so surrounding the entire uh, myofibril inside of the, the muscle fibers um, around these myofibrils, there's this thing called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is a storage site for calcium. So it's a storage container for calcium. Um, and it surrounds all of these. And what happens is when your muscle is told to contract, uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium into the into the cytoplasm of the cell and that calcium allows for muscle contraction to occur for force generation and movement to occur inside the myofibril so the sarcoplasmic reticulum is really important and so is calcium if calcium isn't present muscles don't contract and don't generate force and cause movement when calcium is present in uh, that uh, cytosol, that, that uh, cytoplasm, uh, we will have muscle contraction and force generation. Uh, and so this sarcoplasmic reticulum is, um, has these what we call transverse tubules um, that extend uh, from the sarcolemma, so the, um, the membrane of the muscle cell, uh, into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what this does is this translates the signal from the brain so it travels your your brain has a signal to uh, tell your muscles to move we want to move my arm from the table to my face um, and your brain sends that signal down a neuron that neuron contacts the muscle through the motor unit that we've talked about and what happens is that cur that signal goes into the muscle uh, it goes onto the sarcolemma travels through the transverse tubule hits the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium to allow these myofibrils, these actin and myosin, to work and cause movement. So a really quick process, but a lot of steps to it. Um, and so these, that's what's occurring. And so what you have here is a look at uh, what we were talking about with the um, with these myofibrils and uh, these particular sarcomeres. And so, again, skeletal muscle here, uh, you can see those satellite cells or those nu multiple nuclei. Inside of that, you have multiple myofibrils, so these bundles here. And if you pull one out, you can see that there's a bunch of little, kind of that same structure, a bunch of little smaller components inside. The pink dots or pink lines, depending on where you're looking, would be your myosin, your thick filament, your blue lines are your thin filament or actin. Um, and then you can see there's these kind of like sectioned off areas that kind of go together. Um, and that would be considered a sarcomere. A sarcomere is a Z line to a Z line. So kind of like a baseline. And so here you can see kind of a two sarcomeres kind of cut out so that you can see them. Z lines, Kind of separate them that's kind of the dividing wall uh, to separate one sarcomere from the other is those z lines they're kind of base element they're base areas they're a solid wall they don't really move they're a attachment point for your actin um, in the middle of that area uh, seen by this kind of darker pink line and under a microscope the colors might be a little bit different but you can actually see each of these under a microscope being slightly different shades uh, and darknesses the middle is the M line. That's another pretty solid wall. It doesn't move. Uh, and then what you have is you have these light colored areas called the I band. And this is where you don't have any myosin currently. Okay, so myosin does not, uh, is not in the I band area. The A band, which is a little bit darker, is where our myosin are at. Um, and so um, what occurs, sorry, what happens is, is that when uh, in a resting state, this is how the muscle looks. And then when it's activated, that calcium is released and the muscle starts to shorten and generate force. Because remember, all our muscles do is get shorter and they cre create force. What happens is, is this um, eye band actually disappears. The actin are literally pulled together. Um, so the actin on over here and the actin over here are pulled into the um, M line or the they're pulled towards the middle um, and what you would see in a muscle that's contracted is the I band would be completely gone and you would only see the A band um, because what's happened is is in this model you can see these actin um, the blue lines and you can see the mice and the pink there's a little bit of space here when those are active what happens is is the 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 actin is pulled towards the center this M line right here and this I band disappears. And that happens across the entire muscle fiber and every sarcomere at the same time. 
And so this little area would disappear and this little area would disappear and this little area would disappear and this little area would disappear when your muscle fully contracts and gets shorter. And that's how we generate movement and speed. And so these tiny little movements cause our force production and movements to occur in our body. Um, and so that's kind of how those work. Um, and so the sarcoplasmic reticulum, what you can see is that uh, you have your muscle fiber, you have the sarcolemma, the outer membrane. Um, the green is that sarcoplasmic reticulum. See how it's over every single myofibril so that you can get calcium everywhere that needs it. Without calcium, this movement of these actinomycin doesn't occur. Um, again, you can see the A-bands. And then you see these darker green, uh, or sorry, the pink tubes here that kind of go down. There's holes. This is what's communicating the signal from the uh, motor end plate, the motor unit, all the way down to the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium in the cell. So remember that our muscles don't just naturally fire on their own. There are some things where that may happen, uh, but they fire due to a signal, uh, usually to a, um, a signal from the brain or from a neuromuscular signal. And so what happens is, is that um, when our nerves come in contact with our muscles or get to our muscles, and we have that motor unit connection that we talked about before in another lecture, um, we form what's called a neuromuscular junction. So it's the place where our muscles and our nerves come together so that actions can occur, and that's that motor unit. And so um, we talked about motor units last time and the fact that a motor unit can control multiple or few muscles, and when a motor unit fires, every muscle that's attached to that nerve is also going to give full maximal contraction as, far, as hard and as fast as it can, causing that actin, actin and myosin to um, uh, move. And so um, at that neuromuscular junction where the muscle and the nerve come together, it's called a motor end plate. And this is where uh, chemicals, neurotransmitters, are released from the nerve, contact the muscle, and cause that uh, action potential to be released and that calcium to be released in um, into the uh, sarcoplasm. Typically, acetylcholine is the, the neurotransmitter release that causes a depolarization of the muscle fiber at the end plate. And so acetylcholine is really important for us to be able to regulate because if I was to inject you with a bunch of acetylcholine, what would happen is some of wherever I injected that, those muscles would start to contract. And so uh, it's a really important kind of regulation tool uh, and something that we need to have present because if you run out of acetylcholine or it's blocked in some way uh, that could lead to um, That could lead to issues with muscle contraction uh, And so that's a really important thing some animal venoms uh, Actually and even poisons have to do with the block or the release of acetylcholine causing muscle contractions or no muscle contraction And so here's an example that you can kind of look at of that in plate and motor uh, in plate um, and the acetylcholine release and, and kind of dive into that a little bit more. This is what it looks like under a microscope. And so you can see these different motor units occurring and how each muscle fiber has only one. Um, and so these would be different types of muscles as well. And you can see their innervation uh, with those motor end plates. So finally, now that we're, again, we're talking about how these muscles work and their structure, we're getting into this concept called the sliding filament model or theory. Uh, that starts to talk about, well, how does that movement actually occur? So we've, we've talked about this neurotransmitter acetylcholine being released to cause this depolarization of the muscle and this calcium release into the cytosol uh, that causes um, those actin and myosin to move that create motion and creates force. But now we need to go a little bit deeper and talk about, well, what actually is occurring with that actin myosin to cause force and to cause that movement. It's not just this magical attraction that occurs. There's, there's something that actually, uh, some kind of physical motion that has to occur that then we see as these bigger movements. So, so what's going on? And it's called this sliding filament model. Um, and so what ha we'll, we'll keep looking at it and keep talking about it. But basically this tells us that uh, muscle shortening, so those sarcomeres getting shorter and eventually our muscles getting shorter, occurs because the actin and filament uh, move over each other, which I kind of explained a little bit earlier. 
And so this is done from what we call cross bridges between axes and mice and calling call out a power stroke. And it causes those um, the distance between Z lines or that I band to really disappear uh, in, in sarcomeres. Um, and so this is an example of that. And so we can see what I was describing before a little bit more uh, of how the muscles, we're talking about the bicep again, is extended. And then when it contracts and gets smaller, you can see that this I band really goes away, right? And the Z discs um, get a little bit closer uh, and you can see that M line. And so what's happened is the myosin, the thick filament, the darker section in the center has pulled the thin milk, th pulled the thin milk, thin filament to the M line. Uh, and you can see it all bunches up together. And so the way that this occurs is through power strokes and so what you see is this is a little bit more of a zoomed in picture. The purple here is the myosin and you have what's called myosin head. Okay. And these myosin head, these kind of balloon looking structures here interact with the actin. So every myosin has actin completely surrounding it. And every actin has multiple myosin surrounding it. So there's, there would be a myosin kind of above and one kind of that we couldn't see in front of us. And one also behind it, all interacting with this actin to move it towards the M line and their myosin, they're interacting with the actin on multiple levels and actin below it and above it and all those. Um, and so actin is this whole kind of, um, actin really has multiple components to it. So actin is kind of our green molecules here and they interact with this myosin head, okay? And so on the actin, you also have something called troponin and tropomyosin, okay? And what happens is, is this tropomyosin, this pink line, actually blocks. So if we're thinking about an arresting muscle, so a muscle that's not active, it actually keeps this, the, the myosin and the actin from interacting. So it blocks it, okay? It's kind of like a door. It just gets in the way. They can't interact. They can't see each other. They can't do anything. Tro troponin, what happens with troponin is calcium will interact with troponin. Calcium will literally bind to troponin when it's in the, released into the cell. It will then cause uh, tropomyosin, the pink line, to move away from actin binding site and allow myosin and actin to bind, okay? Once these two are bound together, okay, through ATP, um, what will happen is, is this myosin head will then do what's called a power stroke, and this head will pull, so it'll literally move. The head will go from here to here, so it'll move and pull that actin a little bit closer to the Z-disc. It'll then release, and if calcium is still present, it will reattach again and do another little power stroke. So think about holding a rope, you're playing tug of war, and then you're trying to pull it towards you, and you take one hand off the rope, you grab and pull towards you, and then you take the other hand, you grab the rope, and you pull it towards you again, and then your other hand releases, grabs the rope, pulls again, and so you're getting this kind of hand over hand kind of pulling mechanism is the way that myosin is pulling actin into that Z line. Um, ATP is required for that to occur. Uh, and so we have our energy sources. Remember um, all of these uh, sources of ATP and how some produce a lot of ATP really quickly, uh, but fatigue quickly, and then others produce it over a long period of time, but not as much. And so if we have a lot of ATP present, these myosin head are acting very quickly, uh, moving very quickly, generating a lot of force. Uh, if ATP is not as present, so maybe we're using oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP, those heads are still moving, but they're not, not as many heads are moving, or they're not moving as quickly because the ATP isn't present um, to be able to allow that. So um, that's kind of, kind of how those start to relate into each other. Uh, and so those myosin heads are what's breaking down ATP to, they're utilizing the ATP breaking it into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And when that happens, there's a release of energy that the head, myosin head can use to pull that actin uh, closer to the Z-disc. Uh, so we've already covered this. You can go back and kind of look at that. Um, and so we've already kind of, again, talked about some of the things coming up on some of these slides. So that, um, that release of calcium that occurs from the, the action potential in the muscle fiber. So you have that action potential in the muscle fiber goes down the T tubules and into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. That is called excitation uh, contraction coupling. So from exciting the muscle, okay, 
to the contraction of the muscle and how are those connected, you, you should be able to follow that pathway. The muscle, the neuron releases acetylcholine. Uh, the muscle uh, is then has an action potential causes this kind of change in current. So an action potential ex excitation of the muscle fiber occurs, down, it travels down the T-tubule into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That sarcoplasmic reticulum then releases calcium into the cell. That calcium binds at troponin, causing tropomycin to kind of move off of actin. Um, and so myosin and actin bind. Myosin then takes ATP, breaks it apart into ABP and inorganic phosphate to cause a small little... Uh, power stroke, this small movement of the actin towards the Z-disc, uh, and then if calcium is still bound and ATP is present, the uh, myosin head will then reset, reattach to actin, and cause another power stroke, uh, and that will continue until the muscle is no longer excited, the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum stops releasing calcium, and that calcium is then um, moved back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it's basically going to be sucked back up into that. And so that's this idea of excitation contraction coupling. Okay. And so this is kind of showing that process, showing you kind of what's going on and how it's attaching, showing the movement of these with that. Um, this is the actual kind of full process of um, the power stroke or what's called a cross bridge occurring. Uh, again, showing how the myosin head um, attaches to the myosin and that in fact it, when that happens it causes the loss of a inorganic phosphate uh, and then um, eventually the ADP comes off and that causes this power stroke, this movement, tiny little movement, tiny little bit of power but when you multiply this by billions of times across any kind of muscle fiber and then the muscle itself with multiple muscle fibers you have force. Um, and then the myosin head detaches from the actin because ATP is attached. That ATP is broken up into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And if it can, it's going to bind back to actin as long as tropomyosin isn't in the way because calcium is bound to troponin. So make sure you can kind of walk through this process. Um, and so this will continue as long as calcium is present. As soon as calcium is removed, this process kind of stops. There's blockage, they can't bind and the muscle will relax. There's nothing holding that act actin at the Z-disc. Um, and so this does lead into the fact that another reason that maybe this doesn't occur is maybe calcium is present, um, but our muscles start to fatigue, okay? And so maybe this process starts to slow down or doesn't occur as much of those mice and heads or in as many of our muscles because uh, the muscle starts to get fatigued. And this could be due to uh, several different th reasons, but what it will lead to is um, when we think about muscle fatigue, basically there's a decline in how much power the muscle can output. So a fresh muscle that isn't fatigued, maybe you can lift 100 pounds over your head. When that muscle starts to get tired and fatigued, you're only able to do 80 pounds above your head. So that would be muscle fatigue, less power output. Um, and so it could be because of the cross bridge uh, cross bridges aren't occurring or they're not optimal. Maybe there's been damage done to them. Um, or it could be the fact that ATP isn't being generated as quickly uh, there, or calcium isn't being released as quickly. And so that velocity is slowed down because ATP isn't working as quickly. Um, or, and this could be for things like not getting enough oxygen, not having enough fuel. So there's a lot of things that could contribute to this. Uh, but one of the big things that contribute to muscle fatigue itself is kind of the intensity. Can those energy systems keep up uh, with that? And all of your systems uh, take energy, and so it has to produce not energy just for the actin myosin uh, power stroke, but also to uh, release acetylcholine, and all of those take energy as well to move uh, nutrients in and out. And so uh, this kind of lays out different uh, exercise intensities, and if they're above or below lactate threshold, and percentage of heart rate or VO2 max and how you kind of um, classify them and realizing that basically the, the higher the intensity, the quicker muscle fatigue will occur. Muscle fatigue will occur at any level if done long enough, uh, but the higher the intensity, the more quickly you'll see um, that occur. And this is kind of seen from here as well. So force production, the contraction time, 
how much contraction time is occurring. Um, and once you hit kind of this point, you'll see this onset of fatigue where the force production goes down and continues to go down as contraction time continues. Um, and so again, this kind of, kind of starts talking about what I was looking at. So if you think about really, really heavy exercise, uh, something super intense, something that you can't do for very long. Uh, so running as fast as you can. How long can you run absolutely as fast as you can before that you start to slow down, that force production uh, starts to go away. And what causes that? Well, there's a lot of different things. So it could be a decrease in calcium release, like we talked about. Uh, metabolites uh, could, could be hindering things. Um, pH levels changing. So if you're producing a lot of hydrogens, that's going to take place. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into that that we've kind of already touched on that could be an issue. So quick, during very heavy exercises, what's causing muscle fatigue is going to be a little bit different than if you go to light or moderate exercise that you've been doing for hours and you get muscle fatigue. Um, but these are typically calcium release or energy production, building up of, of hydrogen ions that cause um, acid levels to go up, really a decrease in pH that allows for these enzymes to break down and everything not to function as well. Um, and so again, when we talk about that moderate activity, it could be that you've depleted yourself of things like glucose um, and it's slowing down the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle and uh, electron transport chain and muscle damage, things like that. Um, and so sometimes people will associate that muscle fatigue with muscle cramps, but exercise and muscle cramps are can be related, but typically are a little bit different. Uh, and so a muscle cramp is just an involuntary muscle contraction where a muscle fires when it wasn't it wasn't meant to. Uh, you tend to see them uh, more associated with like prolonged exercise or very high intensity exercise. Um, and a lot of people want to talk about, think that muscle cramps are associated with electrolytes or dehydration, uh, but they're really not. They're not caused by that because think about this. If, if your electrolytes are off, they're off in your entire body. And so you wouldn't have just a single muscle fiber um, contracting on its own. Your whole body would do that. And if you've ever seen someone who has a true electrolyte or dehydration uh, balance issue, their whole body does kind of contract at one time and they kind of roll up into a ball. And it's quite terrifying, uh, hard hard to know what to deal with, and it's hard to, to kind of get them back without some major medical intervention. But uh, this does occur, but it's a major thing, not just this little irritant or kind of causing you not to do as well as you want to. It's a major medical issue. Um, and so there's not full consensus on what causes muscle cramps. It's actually still trying to figure that out. We're, we're not sure. Um, but we know that um, some of these could be caused by neurological kind of things going on uh, and the way the brain's talking to those muscles. It could be the fact there's damage and some calcium being released on its own. Um, we know that depending on what the issue is, some things may alleviate it for uh, some people or sometimes, and then other times it won't. So like stretching, if we've done something to our Golgi tendon organs, our muscle spindles, those have gotten... Um, kind of altered in some way. Stretching can help alleviate those cramps. Um, but we know that for others, that, that may not be the case. That may not happen because of muscle damage or um, whatever. But there are some studies looking at various ways to help that spinal cord communication, which is probably the cause of most muscle cramps that people see during exercise and how those can be prevented by stimulating the spinal cord through different things. And so... Where this leads our conversation now that we kind of understand this function of them is the fact that we do actually have different types of muscle fibers. So uh, in the human body, um, we have different types of muscle. You actually have smooth muscle, which is in your organ or like think blood vessels. You have cardiac tissue uh, or cardiac muscle in your heart. And then you have skeletal muscle, which is really what we're talking about here. And there are three different types of cardiac muscle. Um, and so each of those different types give way to um, different contractile properties. So it could be the amount of force they produce. Uh, it could be the speed that they move. It could be uh, their resistance to being fatigued over time. Um, also, how efficient they are. So how much uh, ATP they use compared to how much force they generate. So that kind of comparison. Um, and so 
when it comes to these muscle fiber types, uh, it's not something like that's easily determined. Uh, it's not something that I can just look at someone or do a very simple, easy test uh, to figure out, you know, how much of a particular muscle you have. Uh, you have to do a muscle biopsy. You literally have to take a chunk of muscle out of you, which is not the most comfortable thing in the world. Um, and uh, then you kind of look at that through some hit. You look at that under a microscope using chemicals to figure out what they are. But the big problem is with looking at something like that is that every muscle is actually can be a little bit different. Uh, depending on the muscle and what its intended use is for, some muscles in our body have... Uh, are very fatigue resistant, don't fatigue easily, while others fatigue very easily depending on what they're used for. Um, and so you have this, uh, and so there are a couple different types of way, but the, the tend to be the way that most people think about it is taking a piece of this muscle, staining it, um, and you kind of look at it under the microscope. There is some other ones where you can do more of kind of like the, the DNA inside, uh, looking at uh, what's called gel electrophoresis. You can look at that if you'd like to. But um, what you typically do is stain the muscle, and depending on what color it is, it tells you what type it is. And so you have three different types that we look at. Type 1 would be these kind of light blue ones. Type uh, 2A, which are the green, and then type 2X are these dark, dark blue ones. Um, type 1s are considered your kind of fatigue-resistant muscles. They're your endurance muscles tend to go for a long time, uh, but are not the fastest or the strongest. Type 2X muscles are the ones that are our fastest and strongest muscles, uh, but they tend to fatigue very quickly. You can't use them for a very long time. And then type 2A are kind of in between. They're a little closer to type 2X fibers, so they're a little bit stronger and faster. Uh, they fatigue a little less, though. Um, and again, type 2A fibers are closer to type 2X than type 1s, but they kind of are this intermediate uh, fiber out there. Uh, and so this chart is really helpful and I think a good one just to kind of put to memory and kind of make sure you can not just memorize it but know what it's kind of talking about with these type 2As, type 2Xs, and slows. So the number of mitochondria, uh, think about why that may have an impact. So mitochondria use the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. And so type 1 fibers have a lot of those, meaning they can produce energy through those slower systems uh, they can produce a lot of ATP through those because they have a high number of those uh, to, to use your aerobic system. So they're more going to be aerobic fibers where type 2X have low amounts of them. So they're not really going to be making ATP utilizing Krebs cycle electron transport chain. So not really aerobic fibers. They're going to be using glycolysis. And glycolysis, we know, can only go for so long. Um, and so that ties into their resistance fatigue. Kind of aligns very well. And uh, the predominant energy systems they have um, and so their efficiencies and also like how strong and, and fast they are. So all of that relates very well. Uh, and so you've got some graphs that kind of explain this as well. So looking at how quick they are, you can see this graph. Type 2 X's move much quicker than type 1's. Um, also looking at different, like, different ways to measure force and power. And you can kind of see that type 2 X is always kind of coming up on top. But you can also see that, like, especially in this, when it comes to maximal specific power or force, type 2As are much closer to type 2Xs than they are type 1s. Um, and so this does actually make a difference when it comes to performance. Uh, so uh, there is some uh, genetic factors that predispose some people to be better at certain activities and to be elite at those activities than others. So your elite distance runners, like your, your marathoners who are winning the Olympics, tend to have a greater number of type 1 fibers, um, where your track sprinters and powerlifters have a greater type 2X and type 2A fiber, um, where your average Joe, so your non-athletes, so most of the population, are around a 50-50 split. So they have about 50% of each. Um, now, some of this does have to do with training, the way they train and the amount of training they have but it actually comes more down to kind of how they were born. Uh, changing uh, the types of fibers that you currently have um, is not widely supported. So the evidence doesn't show that we can really change that by very much. So if you're 50-50 right now, you're an, kind of just an average person, maybe you're even athletic, but you're just kind of an average athlete, um, your percentage of what types of fibers you have isn't really going to change. You can do the same training that an Olympic athlete does uh, for, let's say, long distance running, uh, 
and you're probably not going to develop more slow twitch fibers or type 1 fibers. Um, it's just not likely to happen. You may change it a little bit, but you're not going to ever reach that level of that elite um, distance runner. Uh, so it is something to kind of kind of keep in mind. Um, and so this this kind of just aside to me is that a little bit of out of place, but um, our muscles do different actions, concentric, eccentric, isometric actions. Um, and so that has to do with how the muscle is changing. And that relates to kind of how, uh, what's going on inside the muscle with, you know, in regards to power strokes and things like that. But knowing the difference between static and dynamic is always um, a good thing uh, because it does come back up in other chapters and other things we talk about. And so knowing the difference between concentric shortening of muscles, eccentric, the lengthening of muscles, and isometric, uh, no change in muscles. Even when the muscle is active, it's still producing uh, that action potential. You're still having that excitation coupling going on, and these things are happening. Um, so with that being said, um, the speed of muscle contraction and relaxation, uh, there's a lot that goes into this. Um, so the amount of calcium that's being released and the, the ATP that's present and whether it's type two or type one fibers. Um, and so what happens is, is you have, your muscles can, are, are literally just single contractions at a time. So it's that one signal to do excitation coupling contraction. Uh, and this is called a muscle twitch. So this is where a muscle fiber fires one time, releases calcium, basically you get one kind of power stroke for a short period of time. Uh, maybe you get a couple power strokes by each of the mice and heads, but it's one action potential. You get a muscle twitch, kind of quickly fires and then relaxes. Um, but that's not necessarily how we use our muscles. Um, and so what we have is um, we know the time of this contraction, the time it takes for the contraction and relax relaxation to occur happens in this narrow window, but maybe we need to contract. We're trying to do something more. We're trying to use them for longer than what this is saying, 50 milliseconds. Well, we can start to uh, combine uh, signals from the brain, so uh, action potentials, onto the muscle, this excitation con coupling to happen, and we can start to um, kind of add those up. And the way that um, this is helpful is it's going to help us to produce more force, or to um, or to to help us move faster, things like that. And so, when it comes to this, there's a lot of things that go into force regulation in the muscles. It has to do with these muscle twitches and when they're released, but also it has to do with our muscle types and our number of units. And so, uh, the different ways we're looking at generating more force or more speed. Sometimes that's the case as well. Is we can fire more motor units, which are going to recruit more muscle fibers for a single action potential that is released and that's going to produce more force or um, what we can do is fire those motor units faster and so instead of having one muscle twitch and then we fire the next muscle twitch after it's over and the next one after it's over we send signals over and over and over again so they kind of stack on each other to cause basically the next muscle contraction to not happen once the muscle is fully rested but for it to happen as it's relaxing. And so it, it starts at a higher point and then it goes back up. And so you're seeing this greater and greater force release. Um, and so sometimes this is done uh, to help with the cross bridge cycling and the there's kind of is an ideal length for uh, force production for our muscles, a certain length that they would want. Um, not too practical in most scenarios, but, but it is something to consider. Um, and so what we really do to make more force beside we don't do this a whole lot we we are more focusing on this either more motor units or faster motor units um, where we start was that firing rate of those motor neurons uh, so a single fire of that's going to give that simple muscle twitch just a quick little on off um, or we can start putting more on top of each other so we send that signal and so as the muscle starts relaxing before it fully relaxes we send another one and another one and another one um, and this is, tends to be the way we add to force. Um, but if you're just trying to hold on for dear life, so you're hanging off of a cliff and you're just trying to hold on, your muscles will just send constant motor signals uh, into those muscles and you'll get tetanus, which is basically where the muscle is contracting as hard as it possibly can uh, and it never lets go. Force production is as high as possible for that muscle fiber um, because we're trying to hold on to something and we just need all the strength we have. Um, 
And so this, this force that we can produce with this does go back to that fatigue. So if a muscle is fatigued, it's not going to produce as much force even going to full tetanus. And we also know that muscles that are warmed up and have blood flowing to them and are more metabolically active uh, may actually help with producing more force. And so this can be seen here. Uh, so think about each one of these lines being a uh, uh, an action potential being sent down a motor unit. So a single one produces this, but if we stack them together, so one after the other after the other, you can see you can build this force up over time and then eventually get to a maximal force. Um, uh, this would be kind of tetanus. So the muscle is just fully contracting all the time, producing as much force as possible. With our active activities that we typically do, we're usually somewhere in here. We're stacking them up, getting greater force production, but we don't hit tetanus where it's just firing on all cylinders. Um, this is a graph that kind of looks at that muscle uh, tension curve, getting that optimal length in. Basically, it all has to do with the alignment of the myosin heads with the actin. If a lot of those myosin heads can't act with the actin, actin so the muscle is stretched too far, we don't see a lot of force. It's kind of here. If they're too close together, they just don't have a lot of room to move, so they just can't produce that force. Kind of when everything's at a happy medium, we get large force production. Um, again, this shows that tetanus from simple twitches to where we sum those forces up and then eventually hit tetanus if need be and shows those, those signals going in. Um, and so finally, we start talking a little bit more um, that age um, does have an impact on our muscle. So as we get older, we do lose muscle mass. Um, by the time you, uh, you know, start to get into your uh, middle age, so between the ages of 25 and 50, most people lose around 10% of their muscle mass. Um, and then after the age of 50, um, as you start getting into that around 80 years old, uh, most people have lost an additional 40% of their muscle mass. And so at the end of the day, you're looking at about 45 to 50% of your muscle mass from the time you're 25 to the time you're 80 is being lost. And so this plays a big role in the quality of life of older adults. Uh, the cool thing is, um, is that this can actually be delayed with training. So the reason that it says approximately in that age range is so, so wide is that we know that individuals that stay active and continue to work on muscle mass can actually stave this off and almost, uh, you can't avoid it 100%, you can't keep 100%, but you could definitely, um, you can definitely keep a very high percentage of that muscle mass between the ages of 25 and 80 if you can stay active. Um, one other thing to note though is that regardless of uh, how much you train, there will be a, a slight shift uh, in training people that continue to train through their entire life and a very large shift for people who don't. Uh, you'll actually lose those fast twitch fibers and gain more slow twitch fibers. Um, this is because as we tend to get older, we need to do things for a longer period of time and we're not trying to be as fast and quick in those motions. Uh, we're just happy to have the muscle, our bodies are just happy to have the muscle mass. So there is some change in that. Where we talked about before, you can't really change it training can't necessarily affect that change. We can't increase the number, but aging, we know there are things that cause this loss in fast fibers. A little bit debatable if we actually gain slow twitch fibers or we just actually lose fast twitch fibers, they die. Our fast twitch fibers die because we don't use them. Um, and then there are other things like diabetes that we know that um, decreases in uh, muscle mass occur with diabetes if you're not training, and this leads to greater uh, influences of diabetes on your life. Uh, same thing with cancer. Some uh, cancer patient, patients can lose up to 50% of their muscle mass um, within a matter of, of a couple months of starting uh, cancer treatments. And this is seen in about half our cancer patients as well. So you do want to keep them moving and exercising um, because the body can't fight cancer as well if it's starting to lose muscle mass. It's kind of uh, very metabolically, uh, it helps to keep your metabolic rates correct and your immune system and all kinds of things are tied to it. Um, and so just trying to look at this, uh, let's see. And basically this is just kind of summing up the fact that you can produce more uh, muscle force overall like um, not relative to things, but 
overall force is higher with our type two fibers. Uh, and that's kind of seen here, uh, it, depending on your fiber type, how much maximal force you can and how fast you can do those movements as well. Uh, and so that force, uh, basically power velocity curve uh, with slow twitch fibers, when we're using those, we're not as fast, we can't produce as much, but they do last longer than if we're using mostly uh, type two fibers. And so that sums up our uh, muscle, uh, talking about muscle structure and function as it regards to exercise. If you have any questions, let me know. Hope you guys enjoyed this lecture.